So yeah, no, I loved school. I knew I wanted to go to college, but I had absolutely no idea how I could marry all of my interests into one course. Um, so I ended up doing communication studies, which turned out to be a really good choice because it was so broad. It had um, it had academia, it had like you know cultural studies and so sociology, psychology, all of that. But then it also had journalism and broadcasting. Um, I actually spe I actually specialised in radio when I was in college, when I did my undergrad, and I loved it. And then I realised, of course I loved it. I used to go to the radio station with my dad when I was a kid. He was very involved in um, local radio at home, pirate radio at the time. And we used to do like cassette tapes and send them to my uncle who lived in Japan. So we used to make these tapes of what was going on in our lives. It was like a little news bulletin. And I had completely forgotten that we had done that. Um, so when I went to college and got back into a studio um, and started doing, I did a lot of radio production, radio journalism, and yeah, remembered that I loved that as a kid, watching dad do all of that. So um, when I finished that, I did realise probably towards the end of that course that I wanted to work in broadcasting or in media in some capacity, but I didn't feel like I was fully qualified. Um, I felt like I needed to do more journalism. I wanted to work through Irish actually at the time, so I went to Galway and did a postgrad in journalism through Irish. Uh, so we, I did all of the, the broadcasting stuff through Irish over there. Um, and then I started writing to RTE. Um, the Olympics were coming up. I had a huge interest in sport. Um, probably hurling would have been my, and still is, my favorite sport. Um, definitely my favorite sport to report on and to watch. Um, so I got in, my very first day in there was one of the Sunday games. I was just behind the scenes you know, researching, shot listing, that kind of stuff. And then the, I had an interview for the Olympic Games and that's when I really threw myself into working um, in sport. But it was, really, it was really quite late when I realised that that was what I wanted to do. Because like I said, I played music for as long as I can remember. I, I danced, I had a lot of hobbies and I didn't know which one of them I'd, you know, choose to broadcast about. Um, but sport was the one that really kind of pulled me in. Um, and I suppose when I finished my second course in college, it was the time of the year, coming into the summer, and it was an Olympics year, so I kind of knew RTE we would need people to make tea or, you know, write lists. My first day working on the Olympics, I was shortlisting uh, Olympic weightlifting. So I was watching all these huge Russians lift God knows what. I didn't even know the terminology at the time, but I was shortlisting. That's what I did that for like three days, solid, all day long, just shortlisting what these guys were lifting. Um, so yeah, it was a real eye opener. Um, and I did all of that behind the scenes stuff for a good three or four years before I ever held a microphone or anything like that. So it's good grounding. Um, I was raised by two educators. My parents are both teachers and um, education came easily to me because I had two teachers at home who if I ever had a, an issue or a problem, it was really easy for me to, you know, um, to get help at home or um, to even just to be inspired by, you know, what education can do for you. And I think, in the media and in journalism in particular, I think it's probably changing a bit, um, especially with social media. Pretty much anybody can broadcast themselves. That's just the way it's going. Um, and I think if you are um, real old school, you're gonna have to get your head around that because I actually think education is really important. I think um, even in terms of discipline and deadlines and you can't get good at something unless you do it a lot. So if you're going to be a print journalist, you need to start writing. You need to start writing when you're 16, 17. Write for, and I, I always say that to young people who are studying journalism or who ask for advice. And I get emails regularly just saying, oh, what do you think I should do? You know, I'm 18, I'd love to do what you do. And I always say, start now. Like, why wait until you've got your, your qualification? Because it's practice as well. Um, so start writing now or start broadcasting now. Um, and you know, do it for your college paper or do it for your school paper or whatever. Um, but I always think maybe having a qualification might give you a, like an inner confidence to know, okay, well, I'm, I'm qualified to do this. I also have the experience, so don't you question me. You know, it comes down to that as well. Um, so yeah, I do. I, I do think education is important. And I actually have a huge interest in the, the administrate, the, the, administration side of sport and sport governance and policy in this country. So I actually went back a few years ago and did a master's part-time because I wanted to have, you know, a more in-depth knowledge of of that 
industry because it's a huge part of, of sport in this country. It's where all the funding streams come from and I wanted to understand it better. So I went back and did a Masters in UCD over two years in sports management and that was all of that, you know, that, that all came in around it. And that was just me off my own bat wanting to be just, I, I don't know, I just wanted to have all the knowledge. <laughs> and you, you can't really do that, you know, in an intense way without actually going and studying it. I think the best thing I ever did was to keep an open mind. Like I say, kids got their Leaving Cert results this week. And when I think back to that time, I got a good Leaving Cert um, and it helped me get a good course, but I could have I could have done a lot of things, and, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I think for me, keeping an open mind was really crucial because I could have decided, oh, I got that many points, I'll use them all and do something that I can do just because I got the points. But I went and did a course that was really broad because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I'm so glad I did that now because I could have just picked something really specific and said, right, I'm gonna get really good at that and that's gonna be my career for life. But actually the course I did opened my eyes to um, a lot of different areas. Like people in my course went on and did PR, marketing, business, uh, law. Some even went back and did things like medicine and physiotherapy. So it was, almost like a coming of age degree where you came out of, like I moved to Dublin when I was 18 and I have never gone back. Um, and I kind of grew up in college, you know, I kind of grew up around um, all of these new, I don't know, theories that, you, you know, I was reading a lot and I was learning a lot. Um, so that was probably the biggest um, good decision I ever made, is to keep an open mind. And like you can, you can kind of bring that through to your career as well. You can bring that through to everyday life because if you pigeonhole yourself in anything, you're just going to get bored. I think maybe my mindset 10 years ago was very different. I was very reliant on what everybody else was thinking about my performances or um, I was worried about, uh, if I was ever on air, I'd worry about the audience and am I connecting and am I doing the right thing? Like I wasn't trusting my own gut, I wasn't going with my own gut um, and it's funny like I just said that you know education should be your security blanket and but human nature you're always going to question yourself aren't you and I just wish I hadn't done as much of that because I think it probably did hamper me in the early years that I didn't have this um, standalone confidence. Um, I have it now because I feel I've earned it and I feel like I've put what 14, 15 years into this career that I've kind of carved out for myself and um, so I have it now but I didn't have it then and I probably wish I didn't worry so much about external influences because you can't control the uncontrollables. I have people who I admire in a work perspective you know there are lots of women doing what I do and doing what I don't do as well um, and I admire a lot of them but at the end of the day those women are just women they're just normal people they're just you and I and they're somebody's sister or they're somebody's mother um, and without all of these support people that they have around them, they wouldn't be who they are. So I just have a real, uh, I struggle with putting people on pedestals because they're just people. And if I could go through my life, like my mom, for example, is amazing. She has such great energy and positivity and grace and dignity, despite lots of things in her life not going the way they, you know, should or would have gone if she would have, you know, if she had the magic wand. And she also is um, unbelievably supportive of me and she's selfless towards me. And she has allowed me to become who I am and to go to college and um, even to go back to college when I had the kids, I couldn't have done that without her. So I actually think that it's, the ordinary people who are extraordinary and my mom is definitely one of those people um, I probably need to be a lot more like her you know she's um, she takes people she it's hard to explain she's non-judgmental she just takes people as they are and would never have a bad word to say about anybody I think there's a lot to be said for that but just to get back to your question I think it's the people around great people that are the ones you know that they're the reason why people are on pedestals pedestals but it's the support structure around people who have achieved great things that I admire more so than the people who have achieved great things. I wish that I myself hadn't been so het up about what everybody else thought 
And I would stand by that. Like, I, I, like maybe I wish somebody had said to me, look, you know what? Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the people at home. Don't sweat, you know, the producers. Because at the end of the day, like, somebody is in power. In any organisation, somebody has a decision to make about who does what and who gets what gigs. But that's one person. And if that one person doesn't like it, it doesn't mean that nobody else does. So I think um, there's definitely an innate insecurity in this industry because you're just relying on people's opinions all the time and it doesn't mean that they're right or wrong, it just means that you're not their pick or you are their pick. So yeah, maybe if somebody had said that to me I would have understood a little bit more about how you can still be confident if you're not the, if you're not the first choice. Like it doesn't mean that you can't be confident in your ability.